Moving on. So we're going to start with the buffalo. Okay. Now, really quick, make sure you like double star buffalo because buffalo is extremely important. It's actually two key concept is specifically about the buffalo. Well, where is the buffalo? So there's, yeah, so there's a second bullet down and then also on the back side, there's also an individual section specifically about importance of the buffalo, I believe. Maybe not. If not, just know the buffalo. So in terms of the buffalo, the buffalo are extremely important to Native American tribes. So, for example, the horns are used as, uh, like, bowls and spoons. And then uh, the skull is used specifically in religious practices. So, especially if you go into the American Southwest, you'll see buffalo skulls all over. Like, people will just put it up. Um, it's a really important uh, religious symbol. And then you also have, like, the hide, for example, which has, like, teepees and uh, clothing and stuff like that. But really, really important is the meat. So, have you guys ever had jerky before? Okay. So, imagine jerky. But instead of having a slight amount of salt, it's put into basically a pound of salt for like 30 days. So that's what pemmican does. So basically to preserve meat, since there's no preservatives, uh, they put it into a massive amount of salt and then they dry it out. And then eventually it can actually retain its protein for a year and a half after being salted. Um, so about 80% of the meat gets turned into pemmican specifically so that they can be able to especially survive like for winters and stuff like that. So the men of the tribe are traditionally like the warriors and also the hunters and different things like that. The women, this is actually a, a good difference. So if you get like a comparison essay between native tribes and regular tribes, women traditionally had like really important roles. So a lot of women would, um, for example, be like in tribal councils and different things like that. Uh, so this one's actually my favorite slide. And it has to do with spirituality. So on the left-hand side, it talks about uh, like the shamans and things like that. Uh, so like the medicine man. But I want to point out that's on the right. So if you guys know anything about like rites of passage, so like I know for a lot of high schoolers, like 16 is like a big deal, right? You're sweet 16. And for like a lot of like Hispanic cultures, you have the uh, like quinceañeras at 15. Um, or for example, in Jewish, you have uh, bar and bat mitzvahs. So they have a rite of passage too at 12 years old, but their way for the rite of passage is like a million times more intense. So basically what they would do is when you're 12 years old and it's time for you to become a man, they would blindfold you and then they would ride a horse typically about 20 miles away from the original like tribal area. And then they would bring you to this, which is made out of uh, like bison bone and they would put you inside and what this little pile is right here. So that pile is actually like parts of the bison. So for example, dried heart, tongue, brain, and then they would put you in here and then they would leave you and they would basically say, untie the blindfold when the gods tell you to. And then your job is to stay in there until you hallucinate and you speak with the gods, which typically happen when you have been starved for seven to 10 days. And then you begin to massively hallucinate. You eventually speak to the gods. Once you've spoken to the gods, you're allowed to go home. And then you must find your way back to your tribe at 12 years old. And the whole thing takes about 30 days. And if you die, it's because the gods wanted you to die. Does that make sense? So, like, if you ever think life is really hard, there's your other really, really hard example for the day. So, anyway, so when we look at Native Americans, though, so if you notice in this picture, it talks about, like, different land sessions. So, on the far right, that is basically Trail of Tears. So, that's how much land was given by Trail of Tears, and everything else is Native land. Then it goes from the green, then it goes to the yellow, which is what we're going to talk about today, and then today, everything that's in red is what's left. So, what happened to Native lands in America over time? What's a continuity? Yeah, it massively gets restricted and massively gets constrained. So basically, that's what you're seeing in this picture. Um, so one thing they tend to ask about, it's actually a key concept, is about the continuity of reduction of Native American lands and different things like that. So we're going to talk today about, like, why they did that. Yeah. Um, why is Oklahoma so, like, covered with Native land? Like, the, almost the whole state. So do you guys remember? Oh, not turtle. They, well... It's, it is not fertile, which is why the Trail of Tears. Remember the Trail of Tears moved them from Georgia to Oklahoma? So that's specifically why. And part of the agreement for the Trail of Tears is that they specifically put them in that location because it was so out there and different things like that. The reservation system today, though, in Oklahoma, um, most of Oklahoma is centered in like very specific areas like Oklahoma City, which is not on the tribal reservation. Uh, but in terms of that one, I believe it's slightly reduced, but the vast majority has Cherokee. So that's the major Cherokee tribal. But specific to the Trail of Tears, that would be your contextualization. 
Okay, so by the way, a good contextualization of the Indian Wars would be probably Trail of Tears, so if you want that. Another good contextualization as a whole would be also like Homestead Act, so the movement west, anything westward expansion and Trail of Tears would all be a great contextualization. I don't think that I've ever seen an essay on this time period, but it's like five key concepts. So one year, they're gonna do some sort of a Native American one. And hey, you're gonna be here today, so you're gonna ace that, and it's gonna be good. Um, so one thing really quickly on the contextualization of the first one. So one thing you might wanna highlight is part of the reason why they treated them so badly is if you highlight they were foreign independent nations. So they didn't treat people like they were American. They treated like they were completely foreign. So it's kind of like when you go to war, well, it's no big deal because it's like going to war with Spain or Canada or England. You're just going to war with another nation. Um, and a good continuity is basically the conflict tends to stem around. The entire causation of this is if you will highlight is native tribes and land grabbing settlers. It's basically just conflict over land. And that's what's going to cause all this native conflict that continues throughout the time period. And then in the second major bullet, you can uh, circle the military use. So massive amounts of military to be able to um, basically solve this. And then uh, if you want to start that last bullet of Custer's Last Stand and Wounded Knee, those are the two most common terms of events. You don't necessarily need to know the events, but they're typically used as sourcing. So I want you to look at this quote. So this is the head of the U.S. Army. So it says, I want no peace till the Indians suffer more. How did he feel about Native Americans? Yeah, he hated them, right? Imagine if, like, we said that today of, like, our wars, for example, in the Middle East, if we said, like, we don't want peace until they suffer, right? That wouldn't be allowed to be a huge deal now. But people didn't really care as much about it then, and it was pretty rough. So what you're seeing in this is kind of the start of this whole Indian War. So this is, like, the trigger point. So what you're seeing in here is what's known as the Bozeman Trail. So prior to this time, there was the Oregon Trail, but the Oregon Trail went like this into Idaho and then went up into Oregon. The Bozeman Trail, is it off? It didn't follow you. So. Oh, it's because I stopped it from tracking. Does it go through Bozeman? Yeah, it goes through Bozeman, Montana. Bozeman actually gets created after the Bozeman Trail because Bozeman was the uh, guy that created the trail and then he establishes Bozeman, Montana. So basically it goes up north and then up through Idaho and then it goes to Washington and Oregon. So what happened though is that all of this, um, by the way, in the Plains Indian tribes, it says all the tribes, if you'll circle Sioux, Sioux is gonna be the most common, that's S-I-O-U-X, that's the most common one that you'll see. So they created this trail, but the problem is 100% of this land is Sioux land. And so all this land was Sioux land and yet they made this. So the Sioux basically send a letter to the US president and they say, hey, you know, you're violating your treaty with us, leave, them, leave us alone. So they send the US Army out to assist this, but do you think they're gonna be on the native side or the settler side? Settlers. They're settlers. They literally line the entire Bozeman Trail and they face outward, and they basically stop Native Americans from coming into contact, even though all this is their land and it's a treaty. So basically in response to this, the leader of the Sioux, whose name is Crazy Horse, and if you've ever been near Mount Rushmore, you'll see Crazy Horse National Monument, um, it is not a public funded, it's privately funded. They, so it's really, really big. It's actually, I think it's eight times the size of Mount Rushmore, um, but it's all privately funded. There's an interesting story about it. Anyways, so Crazy Horse um, basically sends a letter to the captain of these army men, Fetterman, and says, you need to leave us alone. Fetterman refuses the letter. So he basically rejects the letter and Crazy Horse says, all right, then we're gonna take it a step further. So what he does is in the left-hand side is the name from the natives. The right-hand side is the like American textbook version. So basically what he does is he coaxes Fetterman's men into a large uh, canyon, then begins to massively shoot all the arrows down and kills all of Fetterman's men in the space of an hour. Now, basically the goal of this was to end this relation. Like if you're gonna do this, we're just gonna fight. And at first it worked. So they signed this thing called the Treaty of Fort Laramie that basically says we are no longer going to fight, we're gonna have peace. And they set up a reservation specifically for the Sioux. And while this was massively smaller than the original Sioux land, it was no big deal. Well, there's a problem. And if you know anything about like history um, or you've heard of this, you know there's a major, major issue in this. So this guy named George Custer from Custer's Last Stand, he is going through this land and he comes upon a settler. And he asks the settler what's his life like and the settler pulls out a small nugget of gold. Can you assume now what's about to happen? So Custer sends a letter to the president that says, 
the entire, every single part of these hills called the Black Hills are filled with gold. I walk along the road and I trip on a rock and the rock is gold. I put my cup of water into a stream to drink and all I drink is gold. I go to put my stakes or my stakes in the ground for my tent and I hit it into the ground and it stops because all it is is gold. I can't even pitch a tent. Was this all reality? No. no, right? Because we know that the entire amount of gold from the entire world only would fill four swimming pools. So obviously not. But what does everybody start to do in America? They massively mush. It's basically another gold rush. So if you want to put next to like the Indian Wars, the major trigger that really, really starts it is that they find gold in the Black Hills. In fact, it was called Black Gold specifically um, because of the fact that it causes really bad stuff. So, and it was in the Black Hills. So all this gold happens and now the conflicts are going to begin to arise. Now, do you guys remember those buffalo? How important are the buffalo? Maybe. Extremely important. So the American government comes up with an idea. Why would we waste our bullets and our army when we can kill them another way? How do you think they're going to kill them instead? They're going to kill all the buffalo. And that's literally what they do. So, for example, they would have these hunting parties. So what you're seeing in here is the Transcontinental Railroad. So here's basically what they would do. So if you think of today like a cruise, do you guys know how they have like events on a cruise? Like they'll have like trivia night or dance parties. So there's not much to do on a train. So what they would have instead is a hunting party. So they would come up into an area and in the morning, it's kind of like a cruise excursion. They would give everybody a gun. They would roll down the windows and they'd say, all right, now shoot as many as you can. And they would slow down to a crawl and you would kill as many as you could. Now, this time, Native Americans in this area are still using bow and arrow against buffalo, which means they have no experience with a gun. So you could walk up to a buffalo and like pet the buffalo and the buffalo wouldn't care because they have no reason to fear humans. So basically, these trains come and they start shooting and there's these stories of, of like buffaloes would fall, but they didn't realize why they were dying. So the buffaloes beside them would just sit there. So if you want to see, though, the massive impact of this. So one day on the Transcontinental Railroad, a six-hour hunting trip resulted in this many pelts being collected. Now, the people on the trains would not collect these pelts. There would be, like, treasure hunters behind them that would, like, follow the trains and then get these pelts to, like, sell. So the people on the ship would just kill them. It's kind of like imagine catching a fish and the fish dying, you just throw it back. That's what the original intention was um, because nobody cared about conservation or anything like that. But if you want the best picture of the buffalo, so this is the height, this is the amount killed. So you can see like the complete disregard. And it's part of the reason why the buffalo suffers so much in terms of their numbers. So in terms of, yeah, what's up? Is that a photo or painting? No, this is a photo. Those are, yeah, and maybe if I turn off the light, you can see it better. So all of those are skulls from that single hunting trip that was six hours long. Oh my God. So you can see how much of an impact it was in terms of the amount dead. Now, in terms of overall, and again, this is two key concepts. So if they really wanted to, they could be like, evaluate the extent with the buffalo were important if they wanted to. Now, in terms of the amount of the buffalo, and by the way, so again, like I said before, they just abandoned these animals. There was, there was no meat collection. There was no any of that. So natives would come upon a giant field, and there would just be dead animals everywhere. It was just for sport. Kind of reminds me of that Jurassic World scene where they killed them all for sport. Anyways, go watch that movie if you want. Uh, so in terms of the amount killed, so at the start of the Indian Wars, it's an estimated there was approximately probably 20 million buffalo by the end of the Indian Wars, that number in terms of assumed amount, um, the range is anywhere typically between a few thousand. And then eventually, and I was just watching a Yellowstone documentary the other day, the Yellowstone documentary said that in Yellowstone, by 1900, there was only 24 known buffalo in Yellowstone. And they didn't see them again for about 40 years. So they were considered extinct in Yellowstone uh, because they had been so massively hunted and destroyed. Now, Yellowstone today, whoops, is uh, massively known for its uh, rejuvenation. So they've been really working on the breeding program. Because of that, they're not on the endangered species list. And if you ever been to Yellowstone, there's literally buffalo everywhere. And they just sit in front of your car and then they like lay down and you just sit there waiting. Uh, does anybody know, by the way, there is another location, though, that was also made specifically for buffalo breeding. And then they transfer those buffalo to Yellowstone. Does anybody know where that's at? It's in Utah. It's in Antelope Island. So Antelope Island is specifically a buffalo breeding ground, and then they transfer those bison over to Yellowstone to breed the population up. How do they transfer them? 
Uh, so what they'll do is they will um, basically put like sleeping medicine in them and I, for what is it? Tranquilize. They'll tranquilize the buffalo and then they'll put them in trailers and they'll transport them up. So traditionally what they'll do that for is they'll do that especially with young buffalo and especially young males um, that can be breeders that can be able to move up and breed the populations in Yellowstone. Um, and then last year was the very first year that they started a bison hunt in Utah. So they have 10 bison permits in Utah every year that they sell specifically for Antelope Island. They do like a big drawing. I think it's $400 to enter. And then you can be like one of the few who can hunt a bison in Utah. Yeah. Was it called antelope island at that time? Yes. And I know it's confusing, but that's because there's lots of antelope there, or there were. There's not so many now. But then when they repopulated, they specifically introduced the bison there. And part of the reason why is because nobody hiked there. Which is why when you go to Antelope Island, you got to be very careful because a lot of people run. And last year, this lady got gored. She was running on Antelope Island, and this buffalo came and, like, totally gored her and almost killed her. Yeah. Uh there's actually one tag that they sell a year for a deer tag there. And yeah. the last guy who paid for it, they went to the salt palace to they hunt. Yeah. And the guy, I think, paid $500,000 to hunt a single deer on that. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. Everybody loves to try to hunt on Antelope Island. It's like it's like a trophy, but like it's more accepted as a trophy hunt compared to like hunting in other countries. Well, it's because he's the only one who can hunt on Yes, island. that is true. And he's the fact. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. That's really cool. What would suck though is if you had that whole hunting thing and you didn't even get anything. It doesn't matter. That guy has shot really, really many yeah. animals. Because I know, because in Maine, for example, they only give, they only sell 2,000 um, moose tags in Maine every year. And so I think there's something like 20,000 people who put in for like the 2,000 tags and then only like 10% of them actually get a moose. And it's a once in a lifetime tag, which means you can only get it every 10 years. And that would be... It's, yeah, it's like our big horn sheep tags that we have here in Utah. Those are really expensive. Yeah. Are the buffaloes now scared of humans? Well, so here's the thing. So if you've ever been to Yellowstone, they are not scared of humans unless... Because, like, people are stupid in Yellowstone. I've seen people f try to feed buffalo before. Um, and people will just go out to buffalo, especially I've noticed um, people from other countries just they've never seen a buffalo and so they'll just walk up to it because when you're driving it just is right out your window but then people get gored so there's all these videos on youtube that we're not going to watch no. ask your parents permission because they are quite violent of people getting gored and last year there was like i think a nine-year-old that got gored because her parents were trying to take a picture of her next to the buffalo so they walked her up and they tried to take it so if you get it's like whenever you see a buffalo they'll tell you to get like a certain amount of spaces away and they're usually pretty cool, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to run away from the buffalo, run to the buffalo, and don't go near the buffalo. But the problem that people mistake is when they see a wild animal, they freak out and they start to run. But a lot of people don't realize that that actually creates an instinct for that animal to attack you. That's why when you like see a scary dog, you're supposed to get up, not run, because then the dog will start to run after you. Life lessons in a push. Okay? So anyways... So that leads us towards the end. So basically 20 years of conflict over uh, land grabs and things like that. Now the ghost dance actually has its own key concept. So what you need to know about the ghost dance is if you will highlight, it is a dance ritual that's a cross-cultural unity force for natives. That's actually specifically the key concept wording. I have personally never seen a question on it, but it's a key concept. So I guess if they wanted to, they could make it an essay prompt. So basically what this dance is, is, is a ritual to try to create this unity, and a lot of natives were doing it. Now what you need to know is if you will highlight, it's used to invoke spirits of their ancestors as a force against white expansion. So that's, the, that's what it's for. And then number one, it leads to white expansion ending. So that's the first one. And then number two is it leads to prosperity. That's the goal. So in the Sioux... The Sioux begin this dance, and basically a little bit of a precursor. If you've ever heard of Custer's Last Stand, Custer's Last Stand had happened like right before this, and Custer, George Custer basically was told, don't interact with the natives, don't go against them, but he was like, I'm going to do it anyways. He ended up being killed with all of his men in about 45 minutes. Custer actually died in the first five minutes of the battle. Um, so if you've ever heard of like, Custer's Last Stand, that's the reason why they call it that. Um, but anyways, basically what happens is that because of that, they want this to end. Now, the problem with the ghost dance is the ghost dance is very intimidating. Hi. Hi. Welcome to class. Thank you. 
Let's go. Um, so basically what happened is uh, they would dance around in the circle for like three days without eating or drinking, and it never stops. And they have like fire. So it looks like a war dance when it's actually just speaking to the ancestors. So in response, the army begins to restrict the Sioux. In one tribe, however, they restrict the Sioux and they say you're no longer allowed to have any weapons. So they take everybody's weapons, they put them into a giant pile, and they set them on fire. Well, the legend goes that one of these people was deaf. And when they went to go take it from them, the guy didn't understand what was going on. That basically a struggle ensues. A gun goes off. And in the span of about two hours, over 300 Sioux are killed 100% of that tribe, including all men, women, and kids. So basically what happens is all this death happens. And really what you need to put next to Wounded Knee, this is like the end. Because at this point, the natives basically say, like, we're done. And the natives decide that they're just going to move on and not uh, be involved in this anymore. And so basically what happens is this ends the Indian Wars. Now, if you want to see, though, in terms of did this just end all the conflict, um, one interesting thing that happened, though, is if you've ever heard of Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, if you've ever heard of Annie Get Your Gun or Annie Oakley, that's where she performed at. It was this Wild West show that ran for like 30 years. Well, a lot of natives who had been arrested, their punishment was to perform in this show. You might say, well, that doesn't seem like a punishment. No big deal. Well, the problem is these were the villains. And basically what would happen is they would like relive Custer's Last Standard. They would relive Wounded Knee. And so they would go into a stadium and people would like throw feces on them and like bring chamber pots and throw it on them. They would throw like rotten food on them. Hi. Hi, I Okay. And basically all these natives were being punished by the U.S. government by forcing them into this show, um, which resulted in like, you can kind of see how it's a continuity of just continuing all the time of the discrimination against Native Americans. Now, do you guys remember Ulysses S. Grant? You guys heard of him? Where, what did he become famous for because, before he was a president? He's a general in what war? Civil war. Very good. Now, he was a really good general, not so good if he was a president, in particular with reconstruction policies. But do you guys want to hear a sad story about Grant that will make you feel for Grant? Did I tell you how he died? No. Okay. I told what, he was not shot. I told you, I told one class, I can't remember who. So anyway, so it has to do with the picture on the right. So this will make you feel a little bit for Grant. So at this time, presidents received a very measly salary. It's the equivalent today of like 50 grand a year. Um, it was barely enough to be able to get by. And then the problem, though, is that when Grant was in the uh, presidential office, his wife loved to spend all their money. So she would immediately spend all their money having the best and most fancy clothes and the problem is, is that they don't have pensions at this time. So when presidents left the presidency, they didn't receive any money. So Grant leaves the presidency. His wife, though, does not stop her spending habits. And within two years, they are in massive amounts of debt. And out of their five homes that they own, four of them are foreclosed. They only own one in Georgia. So basically, they go into massive amounts of debt. Well, one day, Grant is sitting at his, uh, is actually a plantation house, by the way, in Georgia. So interesting turn of events. So he was living in his plantation house and he's eating breakfast and he goes and grabs his peach and he bites into the peach and it hurts really badly. And everyone's like, you should go see a doctor. Well, his doctor was in Europe at this time, right? They go away for like four or five months at a time. So the doctor goes away to Europe and then um, he gets back. Ulysses S. Grant goes to see him. Turns out he has what today would be considered stage four throat cancer. And uh, they had said basically had he gone earlier, he could have gotten a surgery to extend his life. So he's given one month to live. The problem is... His family's in massive debt. And at this time, member Cult of Domesticity, can females really get out of that and go and get jobs? Not really, especially measly jobs. And he has, I think it was six kids, right? So his family's going to be in massive poverty if he doesn't do something. So what he does instead is he writes a memoir. And you can go, they just published it two years ago. Again, they republished it. It's uh, basically his entire life story. But here's like the, the kind of the saddest but the best part about this. So he knew he had to sell copies in order to get his wife and kids funded so what he did is he basically trashed everybody he hated in the war he trashed the way that lincoln handled the war he trashed mcclellan who was that other general he spoke highly of robert e lee and he basically created this like very it was a very honest story but it's not exactly one that people liked about him but it sold a ton of copies 
So basically, this the picture on the right is his final page of writing. And if you ever read it, they just republished it with no edits. So when you read it, you'll notice his English starts to really taper off in his last couple of chapters. He starts to misspell several words. He'll stop writing and then all of a sudden start writing about a completely different topic. So you can see he's a dying man. So this was the last day of his writing. Three days later, he dies of cancer. And it funds his family to become one of the richest families in Georgia. So kind of a sad story. What's that? He's the John Bolton of his day. Yeah. So anyways, that's Grant, sorry. But one thing that he did do that you really do need to know is the things that he did for Native Americans. So the first thing that he did is um, basically he decides that he is going to first start to assimilate Native Americans. So you need to start assimilation. It's a very, very important term. And it's, I think it's one or two key concepts. It's just assimilation. So let me explain what assimilation is. Imagine, for example, we have a new student come in, let's say, from India. And that student is extremely traditional Indian, where they're wearing the sari, they have the red dot on their forehead, you know, whatever it could be, um, even though the red dot is meaning married. So basically, we'll just say this person's a very, very traditional <laughs> student. And they come into this class and we say, no, 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 you're an American now. Okay, we, we don't do that. And then we basically force them to take off their clothes, we give them new clothes, and we say, okay, you're now going to be an American student. And then next time, let's say that they go to speak uh, some sort of a language, say speaking Hindu, okay? Well, we stop them from speaking Hindu and say, no, you don't speak that, you speak English here, and we hit them whenever they speak Hindu. And then let's say that they put their hair, there's a very traditional hairstyle in Indian culture that is um, a lot of women tend to wear. We say, no, 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 you're going to wear it down like Americans. And if you're not going to wear it down, we're going to cut it off so you don't have to do that. That's assimilation. It's basically forcing somebody of another culture into yours. And traditionally, at this time, it's going to be used through force. So I want you to look at the picture on the right. So this is a kid that has been assimilated. Uh, he's seven years old. And on the left, you can see that's him at the start. On the right is three months later. What changed with him? Like everything, right? I mean, he looks like a, an American, quote unquote American, um, from this change. So basically what they would do with assimilation, so again, assimilation, if you will highlight, is the attempt to have another nation, culture, or immigrant conform to the dominant culture. Basically, you're going to come in, you're going to be American. And if you highlight that phrase on the very bottom that says kill the Indian in him, that's like a really common phrase that that's the goal, is kill the Indian in him and save the man. It's actually part of your homework assignment. That, not too sure when that's going to be due, but we'll figure it out. Um, so the dos surveil to act is also a star turn. Basically, this changes the reservation system. So we have reservation system before, but what it does, if you will highlight, is it terminates tribal ownership of reservation land. So basically, now it's controlled by the government. And then additionally, they're going to give people parts of land, but off of the traditional reservation. Why would they move native land to off the reservation? What would be a goal of that, based on what we just talked about? Yeah, they force to assimilate, right? If you're not going to be with your family and your heritage, you're going to start to change it. Um, and you, a, a lot of this you'll see in your homework assignment as well. Um, and also a lot of natives were offered full citizenship if they moved off the reservation. Um, basically, all this goes to assimilate. So what you're seeing here is the amount of land sessions given to United States are, are taken away from Native Americans. So um, underneath where it says Indian land sessions, that one right there. That map, it's, that's the present reservation system in America. And you can compare that to the top left. That's the original one that we had in terms of native lands. Um, so, oh, and this is uh, the be probably a better picture of what today looks like. So in terms of, and by the way, I'll just tell you, you will notice that this entire section, all the bullets are from before. So if you cross out the bullets here under Carlisle Boarding, boarding School, and I will tell you what to write. Yeah, just cross out everything in that section because it's wrong. So the Carlisle Boarding School was in Pennsylvania, and it became known as probably the most famous out of all the boarding schools. So what the boarding schools would do is you would be required to send your children for 10 months out of the year to go to this boarding school. And if you notice, this is what these kids look like. So it's very much assimilation. So uh, what you'll see here is what's called fingerspelling. So if you've ever taken ASL, this is actually how they teach people who are deaf how to speak. So what it does is basically, if you feel your throat when you talk, your throat vibrates different ways with different like sounds. So what they would do is they would teach you how to place your fingers 
onto your throat and force it to listen to different vibrations so that you can transfer from learning Sioux into learning English. Um, and if you spoke any other language other than English, you'd be punished. You'll see this in your um, homework. Like we're talking like physical where people actually were breaking bones um, over speaking native languages. So just kind of see the impact of this. So this is the before picture. So this is Apache children. So look at them. And this is after four months. Okay, so again, if you compare it before and after, do you guys see the major difference? And notice too, if you look at the bottom, uh, notice that there's names like Clement and Samson and Beatrice and Humphrey. Are those native names? No, they Christianized them. Uh, so basically you were literally changed every single part of you as a Native American. And Utah, by the way, was not immune to this. Utah had our own boarding school that ran until 1970. So we had a boarding school. It was in Brigham City. It's now destroyed. It's now a golf course. Um, but we did have our own here. Yeah. Um, was, like, what's that thing when they only accepted children because, like, the adults couldn't be safe? Well, that's part. Okay, well, here's what I would say. If you want to influence somebody, who are you going to be able to influence more, adults or kids? It's kids. Like, for example, when you do something, so, like, let me give you an example. One time I was babysitting my friend's kid who was, like, a year and a half old. And I had gone and gotten fizz for us. And I don't know, I do this weird thing sometimes when I drink soda where like I blow through the straw, and make little bubbles. I don't know, it's just a weird thing I do. Well, as soon as I do that, what does the kid start to do? He did the same thing. And then I found out from his parents, he won't stop doing it. And it's been three years. And so like, he won't stop doing it and he just blows bubbles. Every time he gets a brand new cup, he'll always blow bubbles the first thing because that's what I did one time, right? Kids are much more impressionable than adults. So that's part of the reason why, for example, if you look at like politics, I don't remember the exact statistic, but the vast majority of students through high school have the same politics as their parents because it's, that's what they experience constantly over time. It's not until they leave that they start to have more of an idea. So when you look at anything, like for example, Hitler, Hitler had the Nazi youth and that's how he was able to rise because almost all those kids later became SS guards as time went on because they had been institutionalized. The average SS guard was only 20 years old. And it's because they had grown up in the Nazi youth since the 1920s and started to learn those things that when it came time, they were already prepared and ready to go. Because if you take an adult, the adult's just going to fight you or stop you or something like that. If you take a kid, it's much easier. And you'll read this in your homework assignment. It's very sad. Kids started to say that they started to like make fun of all their own stuff and then they would come home and they were so revolutionized that they wouldn't want to do it anymore. That's why they have that show. I don't know if they still have this show, but it was called Breaking Amish where basically um, it was these Amish kids and then the show would take them to New York and show them what life was like outside of the Amish. And like 90% of the time, the kids never go back because once they're exposed to something else, they're like, yeah, I don't need those traditions anymore. And that's what happened with the boarding schools. It was very, very sad and effective. Also, something that was big in Utah, which is very controversial, was adoptions. So um, I was actually just talking to one of my students in my other class. They had a grandparent that uh, adopted and fostered Native American kids. And it's because they would have these kids and they would say, well, it would be better if you weren't in the tribe, if you were in this. And so they would raise them until they're 18, send them back to the tribe, but they've already grown up in America, like traditional American cities, and they wouldn't want to go back. It was very effective. It was very much psychological warfare. And uh, so that's it. So we're not going to do the other stuff.